Hi, my name is Aaron Lindstam, I'm a polar explorer and motivational speaker. Today we're going to talk about James Rollins' Map of Bones. James Rollins' Map of Bones is a pretty entertaining book. This guy, the paperback, clocks in at a good, oh, I don't know, how, well, it's about 580 pages thereabouts. So it, it's a pretty solid guy. You can see that long book, uh, paperback size. I picked this up in the airport because I had a flight to Russia. I flew from LA to Moscow, did some expeditioning, climbed up a mountain, caught a plane back, and then flew all the way back to the States. And I needed something to keep myself entertained. In normal reading speed, I crank out about, I don't know, 60 pages an hour, and I'm just poking along because I'm just enjoying it. I'm not trying to power through the book. I'm not trying to get an education. The whole point of these books is entertainment, and that's right. Uh, one of the things that when you first pick up this book and you look at the cover, it's actually pretty sexy. I mean, you got some, uh, you got a, a map thing here, uh, Looks like three guys on the cover. It looks in like a medieval style here. I'm trying to catch the light here, so you have to roll with me. And on the back, uh, action-packed Dan Brown meets Tom Clancy. Grade A minus Denver Rocky Mountain News. Well, what does that actually mean to you? So as a reader, the techno thriller genre, where that's Tom Clancy, Michael Crichton, uh, James Patterson, all, all those writers tend to fall under. Uh, James Rollins follows suit pretty well. He gets in the, uh, get, sorry, gets in the action really, really quick. In the first opening prologue, the, the scene carkens way, way back to the medieval era. It, actually, I think even slightly before. So he really pulls you into, hey, this is going to be an action book. It's going to be based on some historical facts. And then it's going to roll you along. So spoiler alert, there should be no spoilers in this review. Uh, I'm not going to tell you anything that will surprise you, but I won't give away the dramatic moments because I don't want to ruin the book for you. Uh, if you are not into the techno thriller sort of regime, then you're going to end up as checking on Amazon. Uh, let's see, the, the star ratings based on percentage. He has 54% five-star reviews. 25% four star, 12% three star, 5% two star, 4% one star. Now, for me, I would say this is probably a four star book. Is it James Rowland's absolute best work? Probably not. But did it keep me entertained and flipping pages while I was sitting on a plane, staring at the back of somebody's head, watching, watching uh, the movie Ice Age or whatever for the fifth time in a long flight as I go to my next expedition or when I'm flying to speak at events. Yeah, it, it totally served the purpose. Uh, one of the challenges I had right off the bat is some of the solilo soliloquies and discussions about the historical facts definitely got long-winded. Now, interestingly, I was actually able to check this book out from the library, the Teton County Library, and listen to it as an audiobook as well. Because I had a crazy long drive down to Pueblo, Colorado and back. So I was like, hey, let's try it again and see how it listens. And I actually enjoy the listening a bit better. I, I unfortunately cannot remember the speaker who read the book. But it actually made things go along a bit better. One of the challenges is if you're not a real historical plus action nut, you're definitely going to have a challenge with this guy. Uh, people have compared it to... Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code or his Angels and Demons book. And because you, you toss in, um, no spoilers here, you, you're going to get some Vatican action because it says it right on the back of the book. With the Vatican in turmoil, Signa Force leaps into action. That's a pretty good opening for a book. So immediately you start wondering who's Sigma Force. Well, there's a clandestine operation of people in the government who live at uh, the, the, the Smithsonian Castle. Nothing you can't find out without reading in a few seconds in the book, so don't worry about that. And then they begin dragging you through the seven wonders of the ancient world in, all, in order to solve this mystery. So interestingly enough, this actually has a lot of mystery tied into the book, which actually makes it pretty fun. I'm not a mystery type guy. 
And so there's just enough to make me, hmm, curious, hmm, curious. Because James Rollins, if nothing else, he definitely does a very good job at researching the history of the book. Now, based on the reviews that people have written online on Amazon, the one and two star reviews, some guys were bashing on him because the editing of Italian versus Latin, because he ends up in Rome, uh, the Vatican, Rome, kind of speak Italian. Were there some mistakes in the in Italian versus Latin? Apparently. Since I don't read or write or speak either language, I really couldn't tell you. Does it really ruin the thrust of the book at all? Nope. You will not want to tear the book apart and rend it. It just doesn't happen based on that. If you're a total language guy or gal and you decide, hey, uh, you know, I don't know about this. If you're a heavy, heavy Catholic church or just church or Christian history historian, you'll definitely find some flaws in there. And I, I don't really care. It, it's not the point of the book. The, the whole point of the book is to sit you down and begin drawing you through a story of these characters that we've got. I'm, I'm, i got to write them down because I can never remember them on camera. Uh, there, there's a character, Monk. He's uh, kind of like the, uh, the, the, the brusque guy who kind of interjects and he sounds like a big tough guy in, in your mental voice, but then he tosses in these super intelligent quips that are completely out of the blue, which actually makes it pretty entertaining. I'm, I'm messing around with my lighting here. Yeah, hey, there we go. Even better. Uh, so, so he's a real good starter character. He's not the main character, however. We'll, we'll get to the main character at the end here. Uh, the next character that comes in is Cat O'Brien. She's kind of like the super smart ninja woman character where she, she comes in, she knows how to kill people with knives, I don't even know if she, in any of the Sigma Force novels, if she ever used a gun, but it's kind of cool that, yeah, I mean, she can get out and wipe out dudes, you know, big old hulking guys with a throw of the knife and wipe them out, but, you know, that's the advantage of knives over guns, is knives are pretty quiet. Uh, the head of Sigma Force is a guy named Painter Crow, and uh, just think about the name there and what uh, nationality or history that name might come from, so that actually ties into the story just a little bit. There are other uh, books by James Rollins where that ties in much more, so that, that's something to consider as well. Uh, there's one of the uh, the bad guys, bad girls, uh, name is Seishan or Seishan. I, I've heard different readers from HarperCollins, let's see, it's HarperCollins, right, yeah. HarperCollins pronounce the name differently, so she's one of the ultra bad people. But she actually has her own personal motivation, so one of the interesting things about Rollins is he makes some of the bad guy, bad girl characters, or bad people, whatever you want, they actually have a certain motivation that actually makes sense. Uh, there's another character in here, I'm not going to give away the name, he, he, he's a major player in the whole action of the book, that he is definitely more pure evil, and I think that's what made the book a little more challenging. Rollins went in to explain his motivations a little bit more, and it, it made some sense, but he's so much of a bad guy. That actually became a little bit difficult to handle. However, are there some really bad, bad guys in the world? Whew! Yeah, they would actually make the primary bad guy in this book actually probably look like a pussycat. So there, there's a primary bad guy that's punishing you, but he always has actually an overlord that at the end of the book, boom, boom, boom. I think I, I wrote, as I read in my books, I usually actually scratch some notes. Of course, oh, hey, I can't find them. Oh, yeah, here we go. So uh, let's see if you can read it there. You'll see a note. Uh, I wrote a twist in there of just all of a sudden, I don't know what chapter this is, but it, it doesn't matter. You can see where it is, it's very near the end of the book, all of a sudden the twists and turns start really cranking around near the end of the book. So you're following a certain storyline, and Rollins does a very good job of this. He begins building up the characters along this ancient theory of, I won't tell you, but based on ancient metals, and it's uh, based on the three magi. That's not a giveaway because there, there are three magi on the cover, so you can figure that out. Uh, the, the Seven Wonders ties in somewhat weakly because you can only really visit one seven, seventh wonder of the world, which are the Egyptian pyramids. 
The others have been destroyed or ransacked. They're, they're lost to history. Uh, in Alexandria, the lighthouse, the uh, is the Colossus of Rhodes, the oh, and then and the library, of course, was lost at Alexandria due to a fire. So. The, the only one that really ties in pretty well is Alexandria. Uh, one of the other things that Rollins does, let's see, where am I? He does very well, is he takes you all around the world in, in adventure. So those things are actually fairly well researched out where if you want to zoom around the world pretty quick and try different places and sample them and get a taste of the culture. Now, as far as how much Rollins actually travels, I actually have seen him speak about his book. It was uh, The Demon Crown he was talking about. And he doesn't travel a heck of a lot because who the heck can afford to travel all around and research all these places? Now, I know for a fact that he has a huge contract, six, seven, eight-figure contract with his publisher. So he does have the money to do that, which would be pretty sweet. And I, you know, as an author myself, would I love to get paid to go around and write these books? Heck yeah! But am I going to get there? Well, if I don't start cranking these things out, I don't know. We'll see. I tend to crank in nonfiction quite a bit, but you know that's that, that, that's neither here nor there. So th this book actually is, is pretty entertaining. I did find some of the discussion about the history after a while. Like, I, 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 okay, let, let's let's get on with this. But somehow it does tie in uh, the the end action scene. Ah, very touchy. It was like, well, you really got to do this, maneuver around. Ah, I, I don't know. They, they wiped out the bad guy pretty easily. Maybe. But the bad guy did a serious damage to the good guys. So maybe end all, be all, you know, you get what you deserve sort of thing. So as a recommendation, yes or no, I definitely recommend this book because if you're sitting on a long flight and, hey, there's the back of somebody's recline thing in my face and I've got to have a book here, and I've got to have a book here to read, well, it's certainly better than trying to read an LCD on a 777 that's staring down at you. This definitely classifies as a summer read, go hang out at the beach, go sit on a flight or wherever, highly qualified. Is it going to be as deep as you might want it? No, no, no. I mean, this is not uh, War and Peace or Anna Karenina or something, but that's not the point. This is all written for market to get you going, to get you curious. Like, oh, hey, you know what's going on next? Uh, s some of the escape scenes, of course they're absurd. People always complain, but they get in another problem and then they come up with a concocted escape. That's the point of these books, people, is to have... You get into more and more absurd situations. How do they escape? That's the fun part of the book. Be like, I never would have thought of that. And I was thinking as an author, like, I, the, number, the number one thing I stress about is how can I concoct something so absurd that nobody can escape but somehow they intelligently get away? James Rollins is excellent at that. So I would call this a buy. Maybe not the hardback uh, since it's out in paperback or ebook now, but something to keep you entertained? Absolutely. So I'd, uh, I'd say yes on reading James Rollins' uh, Map of Bones, number two in the Sigma Force series out of 13. Entertaining enough for an expedition flight. My name is Aaron Linsdow. Thank you very much for watching. Please like and comment on my video and subscribe to my channel to help me out. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.